Right, let me find. Can you see my screen share? Yes, um, I can see it. Okay, I can't see it right now. So I'm just going to see what's happened to it. Hang on. Take, you're on mute right now. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me now? Is that working? Great. Fantastic. Sorry about that. There's always a few technical hitches to begin with. Um, I would like to start by thanking Leroy so much for firstly allowing me to publish my podcasts every week and share them onto his uh, site, Nordic Walking Groups and Nordic Walking Guy, and also for inviting me on to this webinar and giving me this fantastic opportunity of talking to all of you. So my name is Mary Tweed. I'm a Nordic Walking instructor with British Nordic Walking. I first tried it in 2014. And I have to admit, I was quite skeptical before I started, but I took to it straight away and felt comfortable with poles in my hand, mostly due to a misspent youth skiing moguls competitively. At the time in 2014, I'd been looking for a form of self-employment that involved working with people and um, that, that I could also fit in around busy family life and around another part-time job. So I trained with British Nordic Walking and I teach the inward 10 step technique. There are other techniques out there, but research has shown that to reap the full benefits of Nordic walking, you really need to follow the inward 10 step method. With my friend, Catherine Green, I set up Nordic walking East Anglia and I teach about 50 regular walkers a week across five classes in both Suffolk and Cambridgeshire in the East of England. Uh, East Anglia is not known for its hills, so in the picture I'm sharing with you at the moment you can see the remains of an 11th century Moss and Bailey castle, and every week I give thanks to Richard Fitzgilbert, who was the first cousin of William the Conqueror, who actually on his orders had this Moss and Bailey castle built. And uh, my, my walkers aren't quite so thankful when I march them up and down repeatedly to practice up and down hill techniques, but it's very effective for getting them fit. Um, in my classes, as well as focusing on technique, we also cover strength exercises, HIT training, so high intensity interval training with things like Nordic skipping, as well as balance work. So what led me to uh, setting up the Walking On Air podcast? Well, um, first of all, I was very frustrated by lockdown, as a lot of people were. So that's when I began to publish my podcast, which is called Walking On Air. I started in March 2021. I'd actually been thinking about it for quite a while, but there had been several barriers in my way, which I'll talk about later on. I'm a really keen listener to podcasts myself, and I kept thinking I wanted to listen to one on Nordic walking and I couldn't find one. Uh, so then that made me think, well, maybe I needed to set one up. The silver lining of the pandemic meant that I became familiar with Zoom and I realized that I could actually produce a podcast from my kitchen table. The second thing that um, nudged me into setting up the podcast was that I had been invited to talk about backwards walking on a live UK radio show last January. I realised that the research and reading that I'd done that had led me to discover backwards walking and that I used as a really useful tool for my classes, I just wondered what other quirky exercises other instructors had stumbled across and that they use, and it would be really useful to share some of those ideas with each other. So to this date, I have recorded 34 episodes and I've just had over 7,000 downloads in all of the podcast. I'm just going to very 
briefly tell you a little bit about backwards walking and the benefits uh, because I mentioned it. So the moment you ask people to start walking backwards, they immediately change their posture and they start leading with their shoulder blades. They stand up tall, they pull their tummy in, they're walking toe to heel instead of heel to toe and that stretches out the hamstrings. Because you can't see the direction you're going in, other senses take over, especially the hearing, um, but also the sense of touch. And you really have to feel what you're walking on and the surface you're walking on. So I tell my walkers to see with their feet. Um, you can't actually plant the poles at the same time, but it turns it into a very mindful form of exercise and it's very calming. So today Leroy's asked me to come on to this uh, webinar to talk about what I've learned from the Walking On Air podcast. And I can split this into two groups, really. Firstly, there are the concrete facts that I've learned from the podcast. And at this point, I'd like to thank all the amazing speakers who have very kindly given up their time and come onto the podcast to share their expertise and knowledge. I have learned so much from them. Um, I uh, Things such as Karen Ingram's little mantra of lotion is mo motion is lotion and Nikki Sproson who said think of the path to come, think of the path you've done not the path to come, which is a really encouraging thing to think about when uh, facing a long trek. Um, I've also used quite a lot of ideas that uh, people have suggested, such as Sarah Walters on the Mindful episode said that she occasionally gets walkers to do the technique really badly and notice how it feels in their body and then repeat it doing the technique correctly. And so that you can actually see, feel a physical difference when you're doing the technique properly. And uh, that's been a great, a great technique to use when teaching. And it really strikes home a chord with people and they, they really seem to understand what I'm talking about then. But more importantly, I would say that there are nebulous insights that I've gained from the podcast about behaviour change and particularly about the barriers that we all naturally put up when we are thinking about changing behaviour. So for me, in my case, it was uh, the barriers I was putting up when I thought about trying to start a podcast. But these barriers can be applied to all sorts of aspects of life. So I know that many people uh, on this uh, Facebook group are new to Nordic walking or even just thinking about taking it up. And so although I'll talk specifically about what I've learned from setting up the podcast, I hope that you can extrapolate wider lessons that can be applied to other goals that you may have in your life, whether that's losing weight starting a new fitness regime, uh, going for a new promotion at work, whatever it may be, or a career change, it could be anything. So the first um, barrier for me was imposter syndrome. And this is something that I suffer from in a big way. When I thought about setting up the podcast, there was a little voice in my head that kept asking, who are you to set up a podcast? How could you possibly know enough to do this? So I took a deep breath and I considered the qualities needed for someone to host a podcast about Nordic walking. And I thought there were two things that they needed. Firstly, they needed a background in recording and editing podcasts. And secondly, they needed a thorough knowledge of Nordic walking and particularly in a good understanding of the benefits that using the correct technique can bring. Well, many years ago, I used to uh, record and edit shipping market reports and turn them into podcasts for my husband's business. They were pretty dry, um, but I learned a lot in the actual um, editing process. And so I knew the technical side of how to produce a podcast. And then secondly, I had been teaching Nordic Walking myself for seven years by the beginning of, of this year. So I thought, well, maybe that person could be me. Maybe I should have a go. So the second barrier for me was stepping out of the comfort zone. So I've always actually quite enjoyed stepping out of the comfort zone, but in a very tentative, controlled manner. The way I like to visualise my comfort zone is as a circle, and I like to keep one foot very safely planted inside whilst reaching out with my other foot a short distance. 
In this way, I've managed to expand my comfort zone over the years and push myself to take on new challenges. However, setting up the podcast did not feel like I had one foot still in the comfort zone. It felt like jumping miles outside with both feet. It was absolutely terrifying. Uh, I think this was because until now, I'd always taught Nordic walking to people whose knowledge of Nordic walking was entirely derived from what I had taught them. And by setting up a podcast, I was going to be speaking to a much wider audience of people taught by other instructors and also to other instructors themselves. So I really was quite scared about the whole thing. So the next barrier in my way was the thought of what if I'm rubbish and this fear of failure, which I think a lot of people have when they take up something new. And it nagged away at me for some time until eventually I found the answer, which was, namely, if I did turn out to be rubbish, then I could simply stop. And I was not contracted to produce these podcasts and I could just fade away quietly to nurse my dignity on my own in peace if needs be. I think it can really help to have a plan B for what you will do if something doesn't work out the way you thought, or if you find you just don't enjoy your goal any longer and give yourself permission to have that uh, escape route. And for me, I found that really comforting that I, I knew what I would do if it didn't work out. So the next um, barrier in my way was the need for permission or validation. So when I was a child, I was always very diligent at school. I always handed my homework in on time and I liked following the rules and all that sort of thing. So this point is slightly linked to imposter syndrome and comfort zone in a way. I almost wanted a fairy godmother to swoop down and wave her wand to give me permission to set up the podcast. But in reality, no one was going to do that. I was my own fairy godmother. And I had to mentally leap over the psychological barriers I was placing in my way, point myself in the right direction I wanted to head, and then give myself that validation and permission to pursue this challenge, as well as the permission not to continue if I didn't enjoy it, which I alluded to in the previous point. Now, the next barrier is one that I think everyone will be familiar with when facing a new challenge or a new goal. So it's probably the most universal barrier to taking up a new hobby, making a lifestyle change or taking on a new task at work. When I was contemplating setting up Walking On Air, which I had been thinking about for a couple of years, really, I kept asking myself how I would ever find the time. So lockdown did me a huge favour in this regard, as suddenly I had absolutely no excuse. I couldn't work. I couldn't socialise and I couldn't leave home, so time was no longer an issue and therefore I plunged straight in. Within a few weeks of me starting, lockdown was lifted and life began to resume its normal hectic routine, proving that old adage right once again, that if you want something done, give it to a busy person. So since I started, I've managed to publish a podcast every week, apart from a break over the summer, alongside teaching all my Nordic walking classes, alongside running around after four teenagers, alongside uh, teaching several beginners workshops, and also alongside moving house. So the thing that I did learn from this is that if you really want to achieve a goal and you're committed to it, time expands to allow you to fit it into your schedule. I also did find that having a weekly deadline helps to keep me motivated because I quite like, I quite like that. I'm still that little girl who likes to hand her homework in on time. Um, so having, having given my, having got rid of the excuse of time and given myself permission and found the answer to my fear of failure, I then had to take the first step. And I was beginning to bore myself saying that I was going to set up a podcast so I called a couple of Nordic walking instructors who I knew, told them about the plan and asked me if they would be happy to be interviewed. Once they had said yes, then it meant that I was now committed and I owed it to them to show up on Zoom and make it worth their while. I then practiced interviewing people by sitting at my kitchen table, interviewing my children in their bedrooms over Zoom and playing around with the editing software. 
This all felt very safe and was very much me gently stepping out of my comfort zone, knowing that there was a secure safety net to hand. One of the children had written a little tune on the piano, which I asked him to record as my jingle. So that's the jingle at the beginning and the end of each episode. The deadline of those Zoom meetings coming up focused my mind to think of some questions which actually follow a similar format most weeks and just need a little tweaking to make them relevant to each guest and topic. I was terrified and incredibly nervous for the first few interviews, but then so were my guests. And so I focused on their feelings and tried to do my utmost to make them feel comfortable and at ease rather than worrying about myself. And what I learned was that focusing attention on something other than my own feelings really helped me make that jump and take the first step. And then this last point isn't so much uh, a barrier, but I think it's a really important thing to consider before you start something of how you're going to measure your success. So there are many ways to measure success. And the most simple is when you have a nice, easy number, which is easy to understand by everyone. An obvious metric for a podcast is audience numbers and downloads. I'm really pleased that the audience is growing every month and there are now hundreds of listeners. But I knew from the start that as Nordic walking is still a fairly unknown form of exercise and it's a growing form of exercise, and also the fact that I'm just a normal Nordic walking instructor rather than some amazing celebrity, I was never going to get the hundreds of thousands needed to monetize the podcast. So linked to the point about audience numbers, I was never going to have figures high enough to earn sponsorship from the podcast. I'm very grateful to the listeners who have clink, clicked on the buy me a coffee link and donated the price of a cup of coffee. So I have not been able to cover my license fees that way. But money and uh, audience figures were not going to be my key measures of success. So there are other measures which I use instead. One thing I'm really proud of is that nearly a third of the episodes have come into being due to a suggestion of another Nordic walker. At the beginning of every episode, I state that Walking On Air is the podcast for the Nordic walking community. And I'm delighted that so many people have contacted me offering to be interviewed. And this for me shows that Walking On Air really is seen as a vehicle for the whole community and a means by which individuals can spread their message or get their story out. Another measure for me has been the feedback, which has been amazing. And I've been really touched by the encouragement and support from the community, as well as very moved by some of the stories that people have shared with me. Another measure of success is the opportunities that it has given me. I recently spoke at the British Nordic Walking, oh, hang on, no, the British Nordic Walking Association's annual convention. And now I find myself talking to all of you today. These are doors that would never have been open to me if I hadn't put my head above the parapet and taken on this challenge. So the final measure of success, which I use regularly in my own classes, when people are worried when we're walking and they're worried about whether they can cover a certain distance in a certain time, I remind people to reset their measures away from just a single figure. And I tell them, instead of thinking about time, Ask yourself, have you enjoyed the walk? Have you noticed the sights around you? And finally, have you had a meaningful conversation? So if I apply those measures to my podcast, and these measures are things that you can apply to any goal you take on, then I can say with certainty that I have thoroughly enjoyed the experience. I really have noticed the conversations that have been sparked online and on social media by Walking On Air, uh, each week, every episode generates a whole load of, of debate and conversation. And finally, I have definitely engaged in some really fascinating conversations. So uh, thank you very much, Leroy, for, enjoy for inviting me on today. And um, I have really enjoyed talking to you. Well, great, thank you, Mary. That was uh, that was a, a rich presentation, and 
hopefully uh, w once we get it loaded up on YouTube, we're, we're gonna uh, get a lot more people uh, learning from it. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, for Mary? One, well, Mary, one thing that came uh, to mind when, when you were talking about, uh, especially measures of success, was uh, when, when, when you talk about the measures of success, it sounded like you switched your priority from outcomes and results more to the process. And here, here in Alabama, the process is a popular term because we're, we're crazy about sports and, uh, and one of the sports coaches here, uh, that's, that's his mantra. So uh, what, what are some things you would say contributed to you, uh, sh besides what you discussed, uh, to you shifting your focus from results to process? I think that that is something that has come about in my time as an instructor, actually. It's taught me that not just to focus on the end result, whether that's a destination when you're taking people for a walk, whether that's um, a, a, a distance that you're trying to complete. I take part quite regularly in a, an annual 18 mile um, Nordic walk. I've learned that it's really important to enjoy the, the journey and make the most of it and see the silver linings along the way if, if you face uh, difficulty. But I really think it's important in life in general and in Nordic walking to enjoy it minute by minute rather than just focusing on the final outcome. Because if you are purely focused on losing a certain amount of weight, being able to complete a distance in a certain amount of time, actually you're not going to stick with it because it's quite disheartening. Those things take a lot of time to achieve. So if you can enjoy the process, I really like that, then you're going to be much more successful. And I think that's a really key take home message that we can all learn from. Right. We have a question from James. Uh, what is your top tip for Nordic walking in the festive period? Oh, I think you've got to grab your poles whenever you have a spare few minutes, uh, especially over the festive period when we're all rather tempted to eat quite a lot more mince pies than usual and more food than usual. And actually get out with your family and friends, go for a walk and chat because actually we can all spend far too much time, especially here in the UK where it's quite cold and miserable at this time of the year. We haven't got beautiful snowy fields we're surrounded by mud at the moment but actually if you can get outside out of a stuffy home and just have half an hour in the fresh air really pushing through those poles really feeling that you've had a full body workout which the poles will give you then you're going to feel so much better especially if you've done that with friends and family great well thank you um and uh that's, a, that's an important point that you make because I know that uh, on a regular basis, whenever I'm uh, teaching people, they, they talk, they, the, the beginners will, will sometimes feel like they're not doing well or, 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 or maybe they, they might even start feeling embarrassed because they're, they're only just learning and, and they feel awkward. But uh, the one thing I tell them is, is that uh, the most important thing is that you're out doing something. And, and all, all this other stuff comes just with practice, but, but the important thing is you've gotten out and, and you're, you're giving yourself the gift of movement and, and exercise. Absolutely. I often say to my own classes, focus on progression, not perfection. And I have this again with lots of beginners and then I turn around to them, they say, I can't get it, I haven't got it. And I say, well, you've been learning for, two hours or four hours or something. And I, then I say, when you learned to drive, did you sit behind a steering wheel 
and go and drive round the M25, which is our busiest um, motorway or freeway in the UK. And it's four lanes of horrible traffic, lorries, people cutting each other up. And they go, well, no, no, of course I didn't. And I say, well, you started on probably in a car park on a Sunday when it was quiet and you slowly built up. And that's what you've got to do with your Nordic walking. So just be kind to yourself. Understand that it is a process and that it will take time, but you will get there. You will get there eventually. But just allow yourself time without criticizing yourself. Terrific. Any other questions uh, for Barry? Well, excellent. Well, thank you for uh, taking time, Mary, and thank you all for taking some time out of your days to uh, to, to be part of this uh, webinar. And uh, we, we look forward to January as well when this Barb Gormley comes it's on. Um, so, so what we'll do is, uh, uh, look forward to, to taking these lessons that Mary gave us and, uh, and, and just apply them and then Barb will help us operationalize them uh, next year. Uh, the, these webinars, we'll, we'll try to do a couple of them every year uh, with, with people from our, our, our Facebook group and uh, um, try, try to learn and, and uh, especially for those who are in, in a beginner status, we, we, we hope this is of a service to you. Uh, thank you again. And uh, we hope you have a, a wonderful holiday uh, you know, over the next uh, several weeks. And uh, we'll see you next year.